everyone, what's going on and welcome back to the Solar Punk Farmer. I am so glad to be putting out content again. Apologies for the lack of it. So I've had my three and a half year old son over for the past two months, which is why I haven't been able to put out content. He's a great kid and I love him to pieces and he helps out quite a bit in the garden. But unfortunately when he's around, it's pretty much impossible for me to record any videos because he requires my undivided attention. And when you're a parent, your kids always come first, even if you're a YouTuber. Anyway, since it has been so long, I figured I would do a garden update video for you all to show you all how everything is doing up here in my corner of Solar Punk Paradise. So today I wanted to give an update on the aquaponics system, on the resilience garden, on the micro food forest, on some of the composting I've been doing, and a new technique I've been working on that involves harnessing the power of aquaponics to get my soil garden to produce for me despite the terrible quality of my soil. So stay tuned for that. I'll be talking a bit about that at the end of the video. Anyways, let's get to it. So why don't we get started with the aquaponics system because I am super excited with how that's been doing. Currently in here, we have a fresh new tower of kale. This is a mixture of lacinato kale, a variety called mamba, and dwarf blue collared kale, which is my favorite variety. Here we have some of the joy choy bok choy, which is a favorite of mine, doing pretty well. I have been having some issues with nutrient deficiencies, uh, but I supplemented recently and the plants are already looking better. In the second half of this tower, we have an experimental crop, ruby red auric. This is supposed to be a warm weather substitute for spinach and it has been doing all right so far. So in this tower right here, and in this tower right here, we have some very special varieties of tomatoes. This is going to be the subject of a future video, so stay tuned. So in this tower, we have some romaine lettuce. This is the Paris Island Koss, as well as some mirror, which is the most heat tolerant variety that I currently have in stock. I've been super excited about being able to get lettuce to grow during the summer in my aquaponics system, and we recently just harvested a tower of lettuce and ate it. It was absolutely delicious. So the patio tomatoes are done. I was able to pick quite a bit of those off of the tower, and they were really, really good. Unfortunately, they did get way too big for the tower. I do suspect that the variety that I got from the nursery was mislabeled, and obviously that was a factor, but assuming that it was actually patio, definitely not a good choice for the towers. They just got super out of control. And needless to say, the strawberries are quite happy to be enjoying the sun again. They are really beginning to bounce back now that the patio tomatoes are out of there and I'm starting to get some strawberries once more. The strawberries have been delicious and I'm really stoked about getting more of them. Here we have some French marigold, a companion plant for the summer. They are just beginning to enter their flowering phase and up here we have some more strawberries. This is the Camarosa variety. Moving on to the media bed, the chives have been going nuts. The beans have been going nuts. You can see I have some beans right here. These are some heirloom Salvadorian red beans. And up there, those are the Blue Lake pole beans. And they have just been climbing all over the eggplants. The eggplants have been doing fantastic, putting out lots of blooms, just starting to get some fruit, as you can see here. Gorgeous looking black beauty eggplants. Look at those. And of course, I can just go right in there and uh, pick some beans, just like that. Amazing. So eggplants and pole beans, definitely two great plants to grow together. I would highly recommend pinching off the ends of the pole beans if you're gonna be growing eggplants and pole beans together to encourage them to branch out a bit more so they don't climb over the eggplants. Here's the back of the media bed. As you can see, I've been getting tons of pole beans. These have all recently set and I'll be able to harvest them in another day or two. Super excited, we've got even more back there. I've just been basically having beans coming out the ears and most of them have been coming from the media bed. And also back here we have cucumbers and they've been putting out a ton of flowers. We've got both male and female flowers on them right now and as you can see, baby cucumbers. But yeah, just like, as I said, beans absolutely out the ears. Pretty much everywhere I look I just see more and more pole beans and they have become a staple in my diet over the past month or two to say the least. Now, drum roll please. Here is a view of the resilience garden. Not too bad given the condition of my soil. I'm definitely pretty impressed by the growth that I have gotten out of it this year. Overall, doing pretty good. This comfrey has been getting pretty huge and I'm really excited to chop and drop it during the fall. And the marigolds have been doing quite good as well. The dill right here is uh, just finishing up. I allowed some of the seeds from the flowering heads to drop down into this little bed right here and hopefully pretty soon I'll get more dill. Just volunteers coming up. Here is bed number one. The oregano and thyme right here are recent additions and they've been doing absolutely great. The sweet potatoes were growing 
pretty good for a while, but unfortunately it looks like I had a squirrel come in and just completely defoliate the sweet potatoes pretty much over the course of a couple days. I am definitely not happy about this, uh, but I am looking into what can be done about it to keep that squirrel from coming back. Obviously here in the resilience garden, we do not believe in using any kind of pesticides or poisons. So I will be employing a deterrent of some sort. So this right here is where the potatoes were. I ended up getting a pretty decent harvest out of the potatoes. So basically I laid down some compost, green matter, and wood chips on top of this area of the bed after I chopped and dropped the potatoes and it's been building some pretty fantastic soil underneath as you can see. Definitely looks quite great and the plants have been loving it. I'm gonna be doing even more lasagna gardening in the fall. I will be hauling in a bunch of green material, a bunch of wood chips, and I have an entire pile of compost over there that I will be layering it with we will get to that shortly. The amaranth is an experimental crop. This is my first year growing it. Hasn't been doing too hot. I haven't been able to figure out exactly what it needs yet. I have been fertilizing it, but still haven't been able to get that good of growth out of it. In addition, the same squirrel that has been eating the sweet potatoes over here has come by and nibbled on the amaranth and killed some of my plants. On the other hand, the bush beans look great, which is to be expected given that they are nitrogen fixers. I'll be thinning these guys out soon. They definitely need it so that I can get some good growth out of them. The basic idea I had in mind here was to sort of plant the beans in a zigzag pattern and then plant the amaranth in the nodes of the zigzags. I was going to start out with bush beans and then plant plant pole beans near the amaranth as the amaranth grew so that the amaranth could serve as a living trellis for the pole beans. But yeah, unfortunately that didn't quite work out and I'm pretty bummed about it. I'm gonna be trying that again next year. Moving on to bed number two, I have seen a very substantial improvement in the growth of zucchini and I've even harvested quite a few zucchini off of them. This plant has been the strongest one and I think that it has to do with the amount of sun exposure it has been getting. The other ones have been doing all right as well, although lately they have been suffering quite a bit from the summer heat that we've been getting. They definitely have not been enjoying it and I think they might be drying out a little. I tried to put some amaranth in this bed as well. That's why there are empty spaces in it. But unfortunately, that also did not take and got eaten. However, the moringa that I have planted next to the Oyas has been doing great overall. This is the PKM1 variety, and I've grown it from seed. Here's another view of the moringa. Been growing beautifully. These trees are about two months old and they have been absolutely loving it next to the Oyas. So there are a few things I've learned about growing Moringa that I would like to share with you guys. What I have found so far with Moringa is that they definitely need to be babied quite a bit when it comes to moisture levels when they are young. They really need consistently moist soil in order to take off and that's why I think that the Moringa over here by the Oyas has been doing so well. Indeed, the Moringa next to the Oyas has also been doing overall better than the Moringa that is not located next to the Oyas. And these Oyas have been drying out a bit more rapidly, which I believe explains the reduced growth as opposed to the Moringa back there. So it's been really interesting to observe that. The same goes for the Moringa in bed number three over here. I have come to the conclusion that planting them on a raised ridge is not the best approach because the soil dries out too quickly. And this makes it harder for the young tender Moringa trees to get the amount of moisture that they need. I have also been able to directly observe truly just how much of a heat loving tree Moringa is. In my experience thus far, the hotter it is, the faster Moringa grows. I have gotten the best growth out of Moringa when we have had triple digit temperatures. Another thing that I want you guys to be aware of based on my various experimentations with Moringa is that they really are soil plants. You do not want to grow them in containers unless you have a very large container. Moringa really just doesn't do well in containers, especially when you consider that it has a very extensive taproot system and it needs to be able to have space to spread out its taproot when it's growing. It's also very difficult to control for soil moisture when you're growing Moringa in containers and this is exactly the problem that I've had with these trees right here, especially if you have smaller uh, planters such as these. And the plants don't have much room to spread their roots out, so unless you have a rather large container, they'll end up pretty stunted. Anyways, watch out for more Moringa related content in the future. Once I'm able to get these guys through a full seasonal cycle, I will do a what I've learned about growing Moringa video. Because when it comes to this plant and growing techniques, there seems to be a lot of conflicting information out there. So I figured it would be good for me to give all you guys a little bit of information at some point just based on my experience growing it. But everything else in bed number three has been doing great. This is a new round of bush beans right here, and down here you can see the remains of the last round of bean plants, which I ended up chopping and dropping to build the soil. The tomatoes have really been starting to take off, which has been super exciting, and I've begun harvesting some of the cherry tomatoes already. And check out the Godzilla tomatoes from seeds that I saved. My friend gave me some Godzilla tomato fruit next year to try, and I ended up saving some of the seeds, and uh, <laughs> they're pretty funky looking, huh? And the others have been doing great too. And as you can see, the basil has also been doing fantastic. Right here we have the uh, Genovese basil. Anyways, let's move on to the mini food forest. 
All right, here's a pretty good shot of the mini food forest. So I'll just give you a quick walkthrough of this. Right here we have the blue Java banana and this one has been doing absolutely fantastic. The foliage is just gorgeous and it has been growing incredibly rapidly. So this trunk right here was not actually the main trunk of the plant. I ended up cutting that down because it wasn't doing very well. This was the pup that was about a foot tall when I planted it back in March and look at it now. Bananas are such rapid growers and it's really incredible to see them grow over the course of just a couple months. I mean, look at the size of this pseudo stem in only like, what, four months? It's ridiculous. And after I chopped down that other stem, you can see the stump right there, it just immediately put out a ton of pups. I'm gonna be cutting a lot of these off and giving them away because uh, we don't want all of these uh, water pups on here. They will sap energy from the main plant and we definitely don't want that. Oh, and also got some pole beans to begin climbing up the bananas. And they have been doing quite well. They're just uh, having a grand old time. Anyways, got some more comfrey in right here, some strawberries right here and back there. And uh, right here we have some catnip, some lemon verbena, and some stevia, and some sweet potatoes. And basically what I've been doing is experimenting with planting circles of bush beans around each of these perennials to help fix nitrogen into the soil and provide some ground cover. Most of the bush beans are doing pretty well, although it seems that these purple beans have been suffering a bit from the heat. And as for the Moringa, the one that I transplanted a few months ago actually did end up dying, and that was very unfortunate. I believe that before I bought it, a case of root rot had begun to set in. It seems that it got way too much water during its stay at the nursery. I had actually noticed an anaerobic smell coming from the soil in the pot as I was transplanting the tree, and it turns out this definitely was not a good sign. However, I have a new one growing, and this is a really awesome variety that I got from a breeder in South Texas. It is called STX-1. It is supposed to be quite a bit more resistant to the cold and overly damp soil than other strains of Moringa. So I guess we'll see how it does over the winter compared to the PKM-1. But so far, I would say that it's been outperforming the PKM-1, especially when we've had cooler temperatures. That's it for the mini food forest. Things are doing great, as you can all see. I can't wait to see it take shape even more next year. Anyways, here are some odds and ends about my waste upcycling infrastructure structure before I get to talking about how I've been able to get my soil to work with me and what I have used for that. So compost pile is looking great and I have been really excited about the compost pile because I've actually been able to observe firsthand some very profound effects that it has had on the local ecosystem here in the garden. So the compost pile has served as an insect attractant and that has actually created a food source for the native western fence lizard. You could actually see one of those right there. The presence of this compost pile as a habitat for insects has created such a large food source for other consumers that it has begun to alter the food web locally here. Yeah, it has been super exciting to be able to directly observe the effects a compost pile has had on the ecology of the area. And then over here we have my worm farm, another recent addition. This has been going for a couple months now and uh, the worms, needless to say, have just been going crazy. Uh, let me see if I can uh, get a shot of some worms. Been having a lot of worm parties lately. Yeah, there we go. Look at all that, all over the banana peel. Now these worms have been doing fantastic. Really excited about this worm farm. Check that out. The aquaponics system has actually gotten a major upgrade to the air pump, as you can see back there. This new pump is 225 liters a minute, and it has definitely been pulling its weight. The mineralization tank has enough air now, and I have begun to see the benefits of having a mineralization tank on your system even more thanks to that. I have also been using this air pump to run the MBBR, some air stones in the fish tank, and the fertilizer tea brewing units right here. And now, as promised, I'm gonna talk about how I've been able to get the terrible soil in my area to be productive in just a single season. And this right here is the secret, what I have brewing here. So I have been experimenting with a couple different recipes for aquaponics system water based compost teas. I like to call these my potions because I kind of feel like an alchemist brewing these. <laughs> Anyways, these teas have three main components. Water from the aquaponics system, microbe sources, and nutrient sources. Anyways, that is all I'm going to share for now because I am still experimenting with different recipes and different ingredients, and because I also want to do a controlled trial comparing this type of brew with a traditional compost tea, a traditional worm tea, and just a typical organic fertilizer regimen.
All right, everyone, thank you once again for joining me on this tour of my garden. It's been really exciting to see things take shape here, especially given the condition of this land prior. It is truly amazing what you can do with a little patch of compacted dirt in your backyard if you just put a little bit of love into it. And once again, don't forget to follow me on my social media. I am posting much more regular updates on my Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter pages, and you should definitely follow me on there. Anyways, I'm signing off. Catch you on the flip side. Bye.